Well, first of all, it's great to be back in, uh, in Shreveport. Uh, again, I've been here several times recently, <coughs> visiting with uh, the great folks from Community Renewal. So it's great to be back. And I'd like to just kick off by sharing three things that I think color the remarks that, uh, that I want to provide. One, uh, I'm a recovering CEO for 20 some odd years. I went through all the stages. Uh, we went through startup, we went through rapid growth, we went through a couple of rapid shrinks. Uh, we uh, eventually were in the process of taking the company public. Uh, we then wound up being acquired by a public company and I wound up heading up the largest unit in that group. And you know, I was, I was telling first Karen, I was telling Karen earlier, we were talking about startup and so forth. When I was 30, we started this company being a partner and we unfortunately didn't have the word startup. And so then my dad just thought I was crazy to let Ernst and Young to do this fly the night thing. So startup has a certainly a nicer sound to it than just a bootstrap or whatever. Uh, but in my experience, you know, with the companies, and I must say that for about 20 some odd years, we worked in the space of customer management. Eventually became known as CRM, Customer Relationship Management. And so for 20 plus years, uh, our firm focused, we started out as a consulting firm, wound up as a software firm, focused on how do you build relationships at the local level. And we did uh, on five continents, over 20,000 local market analysis. So uh, I really understood the value of business and customer relationships. I'll share a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so that's where I've come from. And the two takeaways I have from uh, going through the stages of startup and growth and so forth is, is two things. Number one, as a CEO, I know how hard uh, leadership is. Uh, a lot of people talk about it. All of us talk about it. It's really hard. And the second thing is, is how crucial relationships are. So that's the first point. The second point is uh, after I sold my company, my wife for a number of years had run something in Dallas called Interfaith Housing. And I promised her if I ever stopped traveling so much that I would start volunteering. And so I worked the uh, last decade and a half uh, with inner uh, city homeless families. And my takeaway there was that most often the tripwire for someone becoming homeless is not when they lose their last dollar, but when they use up their last relationship. And it is usually then that thrown out by a dad, a mom, an uncle, a cousin, a friend, a whatever, that homelessness occurs. So homelessness is a number of things, but one of them is it is the really uh, kind of violent loss of relationship. And um, as I've made that discovery, I've been able to quantify in business what customer relationships were, and employee relationships, and as I experienced that, uh, I decided to work on my first book, was called The Street Corner Strategy, and it was about how do you win local markets and analyze them and make a difference in local markets. I started on this land of strangers, and it took me six years, I did the research over six years, and I really looked at what is the value and importance and the cost of broken relationships at home, at work, in politics and faith. And I want to talk about that, but those I think are related, and that's something I want to share. It is out of those experiences that I come up with uh, the point that Steve made, and that is my belief, uh, when you ask the question, what is your single most valuable possession in all the world, my answer is, based on a lot of research, is that our relationships are single most valuable and value-creating resource that we have. So it is kind of from that standpoint I want to start, and uh, I want to share a story, in fact, the one that Steve mentioned that I opened the book with, that each of you could tell a similar story. So my story is not unlike stories that you have, but the year was 1936 uh, and a little dusty town in southeastern Oklahoma, about two hours and a half north of Dallas. Uh, in 1936, uh, they were having the worst drought on record. Uh, stock water had dried up, flooded the market, Gerland peppers and steers bringing about a dollar a head. And my grandfather uh, was dying of cancer. He had skin cancer and literally uh, ate away the, the skin on his face. And near the end, neighbors would take turns coming and staying up with him at night and kind of literally holding him on, on the bed. 
And my grandmother would later tell the story the last time he got out of bed. And that was when the bank came to repossess the last few head of livestock. They came by horseback. And so as they rounded those cattle up, uh, he uh, got up out of bed, put on his hat, never went anywhere without his hat, went through the living room, out on the front porch and into the lawn and yard. And as they took those cattle through the east corrals and then down that dusty road, he watched they went all the way out of sight, heading west, a little cloud of dust. And when they were out of sight, he took off his hat, he waved it, let out a yell, put his hat back on, and went back into the bedroom, and he died about two weeks later. At that time, my dad was 17 and was a freshman in college. And so my dad came back home, uh, and with his two brothers and my grandmother, sat down and tried to figure out what to do. And the conventional wisdom around those parts was there's no way they're going to be able to hold on to the ranch. They had no cattle, they owed back taxes on the ranch. So my dad and his two brothers went to the little town of McAllister. There were three banks in McAllister. They went to each of the banks and they said, you know, we don't have much. We think it's going to rain in the spring. If we could borrow a little money, uh, your are about a dollar a head. We think we could make this work. And each of the bankers said, you know, I thought the world was your dad. He was one of the larger operators in the county. Love to help you, but your deal just isn't bankable. So they came back home, and as they kind of the last gasp, went north across the South Canadian River to a little town called Holdenville. There was one bank in Holdenville. And in Holdenville, uh, they sat down with the banker there. His name's Will Banks. Isn't that a great name for a banker? Will Banks. <laughs> so they sat down with uh, Mr. Will Banks, and they told him their flight, if we could just borrow a little bit of money, we think we could hold on to the ranch and make this thing work. And he said, I, I'd love to do it, boys, but this thing's just not bankable. So as they were walking out, Mr. Wilbank said, but you know, if you could find someone who would co-sign the note, we, we might be able to make the deal work. So as they wandered back home, they thought, who in the world do we know that has any money? But there, there was this one guy, his name was Buzz Newton. He lives about a mile and a half uh, from where they were. And uh, so, uh, and the interesting thing about Buzz Newton is he had pretty much every dollar he'd ever made. Buzz was a guy, when I was a young boy, Buzz was an old man, and he literally used bailing wire for a belt. He had an old pair of shoes with his toes sticking out, had a pair of those wire rim glasses. One of the limbs was uh, barely cracked, the other was shattered. And we all, I mean, my first image of homelessness, Buzz Newton looked like homelessness. But Buzz had some money, and Buzz said, you know, I thought the world would be dead. Yes, I'll co-sign the note. So Buzz co-signed the note. They were able to make enough payment on the taxes that they didn't get foreclosed. Uh, they then bought some livestock. They put in, got some grain. It did rain in the spring, and kind of the rest is history. Uh, they were able to make a go of it. My dad continued to live on that ranch. He got married. Uh, me and my two sisters were born and raised there. Uh, we'll be going up there for Memorial Day weekend It'll, and it'll be four generations of us that'll be present there. And I say all that to say, you look back at that, and you, know, you say, well, what happened? My grandfather was smart, he was gritty, he was hardworking, he was all of those things. But at the end of the day, none of those things saved the ranch. What saved the ranch was Buzz Newton, the neighbor. And what saved the ranch was a banker said, well, maybe what if? And what saved the ranch was three boys willing to go sit down with a banker. At the end of the day, it was a network of two or three relationships that made the difference. And we still have, in the living room of that old stone ranch house today, there's a case on the wall that faces the east. And on that case is a, is a note. It says, Buzz Newton, J.T. Hall, $224, September, I'm sorry, February the 9th, 1937. And it is a testimony to the power of a single relationship. Now, it's interesting. Each of us have those stories in our own uh, family and in our family background. And, and when we really, you know, stand back and look at all of that, uh, what comes out of that is that sooner or later, each of us will run into something that's bigger than we are. 
It may be a financial problem. It may be a health issue. It may be a marriage falling apart. It may be a child in trouble. It may be any number of things. But if we live long enough, we'll run into something that's bigger than we are. And it is our relationships that I believe, that I've come to see, that are our lifeline for getting through life. These relationships are really crucial. And so I want to spend a little time uh, this afternoon, this evening, and looking at what's going on with those relationships. So the question is, what is the state of our relationships? And let me just set a little bit of, of background. By the way, that's my slightly earlier time, my grandfather with the, the three boys. So if we look at what's going on in relationships, let's look at the macro level. First of all, what's happening around wealth concentration. And if we look at that, we find that the number of U.S. listed companies has dropped uh, in, by half since 1996 to 2017. And the average life expectancy of a public company that used to be in the 50, 60 year range is 21 years today. And the number of IPOs compared back in that time frame, the 1990s, today is down about 85%. There's big ones out there. Uber, there's Lyft, there's big ones out there, but the number is down. The second thing is the number of business startups is down 44% since 1978. And 50% of the new business startups are concentrated in 20 of the 3,007 counties in this country. So when we talk about the problem of inequality, we talk about how concentration feeds distrust, that's very much there. And then we also, it was announced a year or so ago, eight men in the world that have half the world's wealth. And we look at that today, look at Jeff Bezos for 150, 160 before the divorce. And we look at today, the S&P 500 today, um, uh, it, it, we look at dividends and stock buybacks of the, of the S&P 500 exceed uh, their overall profits. So we look at that, and whether you think it's fair or unfair or whatever, what we know is that wealth concentration is having an impact on relationships and trust. Second thing that we look at is what's happening with labor and technology and the, and the disruption. And by the way, uh, we will get these slides to you. We'll figure out at the end how to do that. You can have, you can have these slides. 45% of the jobs that are paid today can be done by technology, can be done through automation, according to McKinsey. And, and, and we know that Amazon, somewhere along the way, became a verb, and the retailers in our communities are experiencing it. And we're all mixed about that because it is really convenient. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think we have our own truck that comes to our house. I mean, uh, perhaps designated for us. Uh, and, and it's interesting the word truck driver. In 29 states in this country, truck driver is the single largest job of the state. So, and, and we know today there is a shortage of about 100,000 truck drivers. In fact, some people are saying it's a drag on the economy. And yet, there's great fear in three or four or five years with self-driving vehicles that that job will go away. And it's particularly important because a number of people who do that job are folks who have GEDs and high school degrees and you don't have to have a college degree. So it's significant. So not only is there distrust from inequality, but there is disruption in the labor force that's, that's really tough. Uh, I recently uh, uh, spoke to uh, a group of construction CEOs in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The estimate in Dallas right now today is there's a shortage of about 30,000 construction workers in the North Dallas-Fort Worth area. They're estimating that the average project today is running two months behind because we don't have enough workers. So simultaneously, we have a labor shortage and great fear that there's going to be disruptive removal of jobs from our economy. Um, and, and when we look at that today, we find that there is uh, basically about a million more job openings today in this country than there are job seekers. So we have uh, the polarity of both too many uh, jobs and not enough workers and fear of too many workers and not enough jobs. Third thing we look at is leadership and what's happening with what I call the deauthorization of leadership. 
and it really is kind of rather concerning. It, we've had in trust the largest ever drop in terms of trust, according to Edelman, in business, government, media, and non-government organizations. The leadership gap, according to Deloitte, 52 regions around the world, when they ask the question, what do you need for your leaders and what are you getting from your leaders? In all 52 regions, they say the gap has grown between what I need from my leaders and what I'm getting from my leaders. Um, and if you look at CEO credibility, we find that the credibility gap has widened by about 12 percentage points in terms of loss of credibility uh, for CEOs. 50 percent of workers today in this country would not recommend their current employer to a friend. 50 percent. So you look at all of that and you say, what's going on? Have all the leaders in the world become stupid overnight? Or is there something else going on? Is there a sea change going on that's impacting how we view leadership? And I think all of these areas, the inequality, the disruption, and so forth, have profound implications. I'm not going to get into politics here, but a survey just earlier this week that Frank Runs put out, 52% of people who voted for Clinton this last year say they would prefer to live in a country that's socialist versus uh, what we have in terms of capitalists. Now, it's interesting. The word socialism is loaded. People mean a lot of different things by that. So we can easily misinterpret that. And if you look at the, the current tax rate, 7% of people are, are out there today. You say that 79% of Clinton voters and 47% of Trump voters say they would be in favor of a 70% tax rate on the top 1%. I say all that to say the, the relationship shifts that are going on are being translated as a demand for change in leadership. And that's what we're going to talk about at the back end. What does this mean for us as leaders today? So, we've been in a world where shareholder value, particularly among public companies, have driven the boat. And yet I want to just look at this list of CEOs where we have what I would call the stakeholder revolt. Wells Fargo, the CEO stepped down, and now we've had another CEO step down uh, just in the last uh, month or so. Why? Because the state of the way they were treating a stakeholder called customer. We all heard about the new accounts and so forth. You look at Uber, the CEO of Uber, an incredibly successful company. The CEO steps down. Why? Because of a toxic work culture where the stakeholders call workers and employees at the end of the day uh, create enough concern that the board uh, asked the CEO and, and co-founders to step down. Top of John, the CEO there, John Schnatter, basically for making comments, racial slurs, asked to step down. If you look at CBS, uh, Munez sat down, why? over sexual uh, impropriety and acquisitions. If you look at Google, Google just a few weeks ago had a massive 17,000 person walkout. Why? Because they felt like the top management was not responsive to some of the accusations and some of the things around uh, sexual ac uh, accusations and, and culture. And then finally, you look at uh, uh, Tesla and what happened with Elon Musk uh, for tweeting, inappropriately for supposedly shoving an employee. If you look at all of those, and we could put a bunch more up there uh, today, those CEOs did not get in trouble because they were not delivering shareholder value. They got in trouble because other stakeholders now are coming forward and are demanding demands of their leadership that the board and increasing now, BlackRock and a bunch of the other really significant uh, uh, funders of, of corporate organizations deem to be sufficient for them to be replaced. So what I want to talk about is what I call the relational risk, what I call the disengagement economy, an economy that's trying to run basically on disengagement. And the, the dramatic shift in the role of stakeholders, not just shareholders, stakeholders, uh, that are there, and whether they're employees or whether they're customers or whether they're citizens or whether they're the local community 
that stakeholders have elevated the demands and the bar for leadership unlike anything we've seen before. And it gets to the core of the issue around relationships. So we're going to talk about kind of the, the stakeholder revolt that's going on. We're going to talk about why relationships are so crucial. And then we're going to talk about relational leadership. But I want to just start out by asking this question. What is your leadership intention regarding productive relationships? Now, I would like to say that everyone in here is a leader, whether it's in a formal environment or an informal environment, whether it's in your family, in your business, in your church, in your school, in your community, wherever you are. And the question is, what is your intention about being a force for producing more productive relationships? So, uh, I'm going to talk about six domains. I'll try to get through that fairly quickly. Edwards Newton said, In God we trust all others bring data. Some of you are just going to want to throw up the non-engineers at the data. But I come from a world where it's really important to look at the data, not because the data delivers all truth, but because it helps us at times go a little deeper to understand what's going on. I start out with home. And we're all kind of worn out with this part of the story. It's what I call the rule of 50. In the last 50 years, we know that the divorce rate now is about 50%, and it's doubled over uh, the last several decades. It's ticked down just a little recently. And the increase in the number of people who live alone is up 114% uh, uh, since 1960. We all know that marriage is down by about 50%. And we also know that when you look at, at marriage, that single now is the new majority in terms of demographic. It's the largest group in our society. And, and in, it was 22% as recently as back in the 70s. And we all know, we've heard that we can kind of throw up, that 50% of the kids born to mothers under 30 in this country are born into single parent households. And we know quantitatively that those kids are five times as likely to experience poverty as those who built born into two-person households. Now let me say right here, I'm not here to beat any of us up on relationships. Relationships are hard. And every one of us have had areas where our relationships fail. So what I'm not here is to beat us up. But what I want to talk about is how do we become more intentional about a society that is hungry for more relationships. Well, we all know that stuff about the family. Let's look at friends. The number of close go-to friends, the friends you go to if you're really in a bind, uh, has declined by a third. Twenty-some-odd years ago, the most frequent answer, the mode, to how many close go-to friends you have, was three. Today, the mode, the most frequent answer, zero. Zero close friends. And then we look at community, and this is a fairly recent kind of piece of research that's coming out of that, but if you look at research on community, what we find is that the erosion of community is not equally distributed. In fact, it's unequally distributed. Some communities are doing much better than others. And if you look at this, we have a term now called the death of despair. And you've all heard about this. Uh, 45,000 uh, suicides this last year. 70,000 drug overdoses. Drug overdose now is the number one cause of death for those under age 50. Number one. And when we look at that, what we're finding is, and the research is showing, is that we've historically looked at households. What's going on in these people's lives that's causing them to overdose or commit suicide or whatever? The more recent research is showing is that often it's not just a factor of at the household level, it's what's going on or not going on at the community level. And so some communities are really not doing okay. And it is in those communities that we get tremendous spike in suicide, drug overdose, and so forth. Um, and Raj Che out of Harvard's done some really remarkable research. And he's asked the question, in our most vulnerable neighborhoods, what is it that most significantly gives people a chance to move out, to have more upward mobility? And what he's found is the single most powerful predictor of a person's ability to move up and out into a better life is the percentage of single parent households. And the higher the percentage of single parent households, the harder it is to get out. 
And, it, it, and, and further looking at it, they've looked at some where they match up for ethnic or socioeconomic or whatever. And one of his examples is Watts versus Compton in California. And a tremendous difference in terms of the number of single parent households, the impact that had on those that got trapped, and the number particularly of men that went to jail. It turns out that community, either a strong connected community or a disconnected community, has a disproportionate impact on what's going on in people's lives. It's not the only thing, but it's significant. We know that in 17 of the 50 largest school systems in this country, 50% of the kids that go into the freshmen have not graduated four years later as a senior. So when we think about communities now, we increasingly look at communities and say, how do they play a role in terms of the challenges we have? Okay, let's look at work. And if, when we look at work, we know that there's significant shifts going on. Just a couple of highlights. Um, the last big studies done worldwide saw that customer defections, that is the customers leaving organizations up about 30%. We did over 20,000 analyses of this all over the world. We found consistently a 1% increase in customer defection. On average, cost you about 5% in terms of bottom line in terms of profits. It turns out it's really significant. And so when we look at that, we say, well, what's going on there? 86% of people say they trust corporations less than they did five years ago. And we look at advertising, the way we communicate with customers. Uh, an online survey looked at the word advertising and said, what word is most frequently associated with advertising? And the word is false. False advertising. The brand of advertising increasingly has become distrust. So we look at that in terms of customers. We look at employees. One of the things we know over the last few years, up until just recently, a lot of people were trapped in jobs, but the level of quits, you as the Labor Department tracks this, the level of quits now is at an all-time high. People are quitting jobs at a higher rate uh, than in the last 17 years. People typically join companies but they leave bosses. Boss is the number one reason that people leave their current uh, employer. And uh, when we look at engagement, as I mentioned before, 70% of workers today self-report to Gallup that they are disengaged at work. And, and further, 18% say they're actively disengaged. I mean, they got a list. They say, God, I hope I didn't like to go to work today to engage. <laughs> so they're actively disengaged. And what we know is that people who are engaged at work give 57% more effort and are 87% less likely to resign. So it turns out that the customer relationship and the employer relationship are really, really crucial. Uh, a final thing. Fairly recent research says for each working age employed male looking for work today, there are three that are idle. It's called the labor participation rate. Three are idle. If you go back and look at that, in 1964, that was about 3%. Today, it's a little over 11%. So we have not only disengaged people at work, we have further disengaged people who've given up or, lost or stopped looking for work. So an incredible level of disengagement. And then we look at management. Uh, a report just came out today, some of you may have seen it, uh, Price Waterhouse, PwC. Uh, CEO turnover in 2018 is the highest it's been since they've been keeping uh, doing the research. And interestingly enough, the new number one reason for CEO Oh, turnover. This is among the top 2,500 companies in the world. Number one reason, ethical lapses. Number one reason. So when we look at, at, at CEO and top leadership, again, we find that there is disruption going on and dissatisfaction. Um, Prey Magazine did a survey a couple years ago. 35% of workers say they would be willing to forgo a significant pay raise in exchange for having their boss fired. <laughs> now, where's the mafia when you need them? I mean, you know, that, we could use some help with that. But a lot of that is happening. And then you look in public companies in terms of shareholder churn. 
and we look at, if you go back to the 70s, typical public company turned over a little over 20% of their shareholders, today it's over 200%. So you go back and you say, okay, what do we have here? We have basically transient customers being served by transient employees who work for transient management in companies that are owned by transient stakeholders. If you were trying to design a system for dysfunction, those would be the stats that you would shoot for. So we bring all that together and we say, that's a challenge. Then we look at politics and uh, it, it's interesting. Two things I'll say. Michael Porter at Harvard says, political dysfunction is the biggest threat to economic competitiveness. Jerry Diamond had a new book uh, out. I heard him speak two nights ago. He's gone in and looked in countries around the world where democracy has failed and where they've had upheaval, the name of the book. Here's his conclusion. One of the top two reasons that democracies fail is because politicians are unwilling or unable to compromise. And we can all relate to that. We see that like never before. So if you look at really the political leaders, what we find is, is that the something called the presidential opposition gap has simply, how do people in the same party view the president of the United States versus people in the other party? It used to be there was about a 30% differential. We mostly agreed on approval, but if it was the other party, we said that I have about a 30% lower approval level. Particularly in the Bush and then the Obama administrations, that number went up into the 70s. Today, it's 72% under Trump, and it's interesting, 80% of Republicans and 8% of Democrats approve of Trump. Just the opposite of what it was under Obama, just reverse the numbers, about 8% of Democrats approve of Obama, 8%. There's this huge chasm between that basically, when you ask the question, do you approve of the president, for most people, it is, what party is that person in? That's the, you give the answer to, what party are they in? And then you look at, at Congress approval. Uh, it was in about 50% in 2003. Today, it's about 17%. And if you look at political moderates, it used to be, going back in the 70s, about 40% of congressmen using a mccarty pool scale, about 40% were moderate, 30% liberal, 30% conservative, progressive conservative. Today it's 10% moderate using the same scale and 90% one way or the other. So a significant shift in terms of how divided we are. And then we look at us as voters because we complain about how our leaders are. But it's interesting today. Ideology has increasingly been, is equal to the question of tribal identity. That is, my ideology is, reflects what tribe I've decided to join or vice versa. In the election this past year, well, back up, in 1970, in the 70s, about 29% of voters said they're ideologically extreme. Today, about 50% say so. In the last election, in 2016, about half the people who voted for either President uh, Trump or candidate Clinton say they were voting against the other candidate. So about half of our voters vote against someone, not for someone. So that whole thing of, of opposition. And what we find is today, rather than serving 45% of Democrats today, 35% of Republicans say they would be unhappy if their child married someone in the other party. <laughs> that was 5% in 1960. That's how far we've moved in terms of relational uh, opposition. Uh, and the number of people today who trust the government to do the right thing uh, has really shifted. In the 60s, about 68%. Today, 13%. We spend more money on elections and more money on government than we've ever spent before. Dolly Parton has got this name. Don't worry. Dolly Parton says it costs a whole lot of money to look this cheap. <laughs> it costs a lot of money to make us dis dissatisfied with what's going on in terms of government and political leadership. And party defections. If you look at the number of people who say they're a member of a party, uh, party defections to become independent, 
Uh, we found those have doubled in the last 20 years. Increasingly, we define ourselves by the party we're not in. I'm not a Democrat, and I'm not a Republican. That's the largest group we have in our nation today. So, we look at politics as further challenge in terms of the dysfunction. And then I love Anne Lamont, really good faith. You can safely assume you created God in your own image, when it turns out God hates all the same people you do. And we see that over and again today. And it's interesting about church or synagogue or mosque or whatever local belief organization you look at. Some fairly recent research. Robert Putnam says 50% of the community or associational memberships in local communities are tied to some level of faith, church, synagogue, mosque, whatever. About 50%. And those who are frequenters of a local church, synagogue, a mosque, whatever, are less likely to cheat on their marriage, they're less likely to divorce, they're less likely to be abused, they're happier, they live longer, and they're five times less likely to commit suicide. And their kids, local community, are less likely to have drug abuse, delinquency, and to have stronger both parental and peer-based relationships. You would think with those statistics that we would be really going at it in terms of the churches. But what we know is, is that first of all, about a little over half the people say that uh, religion is under attack. Just under half say that religious right is imposing its will, so we can't even agree on what we disagree on. <laughs> and if you look at religious affiliation, today about half of adults have changed religious affiliation. In 1955, that was 15%. So we see, again, the relational dynamic, the relational shift being really significant. And, and if you look at unaffiliated, are the knots. You know, I'm not Democrat, not Republican, and I'm not associated with a religious organization. Uh, that has doubled in the last 18 years. And we all saw the numbers just a couple of weeks ago. The number of members of churches has gone from 70% down to 50%. And I'm going to step on some toes here, but here's just what the trends look like going forward. If you think of, of religious groups or people of belief, places where we would hope reconciliation takes place, uh, places where healing occurs, uh, what we find is that the groups that are most oppositional are the ones that are growing the fastest. Mainline churches uh, are down about 50% or losing about 2% market share per year. And what we also see is the number of them are splitting in terms of denominations. And the groups that are growing rapidly, atheists, very conservative Christians, Orthodox Jews, radical Islam. So the groups that are growing are those that tend to be most outspoken and oppositional. So if we look at those four key communities, home, work, politics, and faith, we say in each of those places where relationships are really important, that the numbers show uh, significant loss. Let's look at a couple other things uh, briefly. If you look at generational change, and a lot of talk about the millennials, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, we know that the millennials are the largest workforce demographic uh, that's out there today, 92 million. 50% of millennials say they would prefer to be unemployed as opposed to working in a job they don't like. That's a very different value set uh, than, than baby boomers have. Uh, and, and their biggest fear is to be in a job where they work uh, too hard. They looked at, where did they get that? They looked at people like me who worked really hard and traveled and was gone a lot. So I can look at that and question it, but I also look at they're not impressed with some of what they've seen in, the, in their parents. 81% uh, say they believe they should be able to set their own hours and to work autonomously. And working autonomously has the same value to them as a 13% uh, increase in pay. I don't suggest you go to the office tomorrow and say we're going to dock you back. But the fact is, autonomy and work really is important to them. And 70% hope to work somewhere along the way in a tradition, in an independent organization. Uh, the author of New Power says participation. Here's what's emerging most visibly among people under 30 is a new expectation that participation is an inalienable right. 
Many of us baby boomers grew up in an environment that says, we will earn our way, we've been there long enough, and we've got enough seniority and so forth, that our participation will be invited. The millennials don't view it that way, they want participation. So this issue of participation comes up over and over again. 79% hope to work at a socially responsible uh, organization, and to their credit, the millennials are much more likely to be purpose-focused, they're more likely to volunteer, so there's a lot that's really very positive and has great potential for us in terms of leadership if we can connect with it. I'll talk about that at the back end. And Mark Warner said, millennials don't ask where do you work, they ask what are you working on? The idea of purpose, is it meaningful, is it going to matter? Is that going to make a difference in this world? So we're worlds apart generationally. There's always been generational differences, but the rate of change today makes that tough. And then finally, technology. You knew we couldn't be on this topic without talking about technology. The research this day with brain scans where they can literally see what's going on in people's brains. You may have seen this piece on 60 Minutes. Smartphones, tablets, and video games are physically changing the brains of adolescents. They literally can see the shifts occur. More on that in a second. Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, kind of a tech guy, says, our information is being weaponized against us. Your profile algorithms serve up increasingly extreme content, stuff that will rile you up. It magnifies our worst tendencies, it deepens divisions and sites of violence, and undermines our shared sense of, of, of self and, and what's true and what's false. The way technology works, we all know this, is eyeballs is what matters and what draws eyeballs is drama and often inciting kind of information. Uh, and then finally, if you look at what's happening in terms of the uh, social media and technology. The average 8 to 18 year old today is spending 7 hours and 38 minutes on their devices. And their parents are plenty worried about it because they think that's going to be a problem. Their parents are spending 9 hours a day on their devices. <laughs> now, to be fair, some of that screen time is at work, uh, but it's still a significant uh, thing in terms of the parents. Uh, Robert Putnam says the average household is losing about 70 minutes per day on average compared to a decade or so ago in terms of just together time because of the devices. Um, and we now have new terms. Facebook depression, technology addiction. Technology addiction now, they literally can see the graying out in people's brains and say that you, it looks very much like cocaine and alcohol addiction. It is a physiological thing, not just a social or psychological thing. And we just saw that um, this is fairly new information. Uh, Jean Queen, who's done a lot of work on this, dramatic drop in the well-being of our teens starting in about 2011 and 12. Teens have really changed. I did a, a session recently with a group of university CEOs, and they said the counseling requirements at our universities jumped up dramatically starting about 2012-13. Why? So the first generation has had the smartphone in their pocket their, their whole life, their whole experiences. And what we know is the more time, this is a big study, the more time our kids spend on smartphones, the less happy they are. The more time any of us spend on Facebook, uh, the, the less happy we are, the less empathy we have, and the more envy we experience. Um, and finally, what we know about technology, it has the ability to wound unlike anything we've seen before. And you look at cyberbullying, you look at talk radio, cable, you look at all of those things. Our ability to wound people has really increased. The head of software development in our company had a saying, he said, if you give a fool a faster tool, what you get is a faster fool. <laughs> and we have all experienced that. Our ability to respond instantly, uh, emotionally, globally, anonymously, has great potential to wound. So, uh, what does that all look like when we bring it together? This generation not, uh, not married, not a parent, not the community, not a Democrat, not a Republican, not the church, not, not, not. What does it look like? What does the generation not that we're all in now look like? We start out with kids 
from broken homes and broken communities. Communities that are not connected, communities that are not working together. It shows up as poor performance in school. And we all know that then creates just in function of a number of things. One of them is, is poor workers, workers who aren't very effective, sometimes disconnected uh, idle workers, and often alienated and angry people who are not a part of society. As we have less effective workers, our ability to compete globally decreases, and that means loss of jobs. And what that all culminates is a loss of tax revenue from those that are idle, a much greater demand for services with all the dysfunction that uh, we have going on, greater deficits, gridlock, and a group out of Washington, D.C., I think Tim says it's about a $4.7 trillion problem. What if they're off by a trillion? Uh, the fact is, as we begin to try to quantify this, it's really uh, significant. Uh, Anne Lamont says things are deteriorating faster than I can lower my standards. <laughs> now, for those who want to go in life and don't just commit suicide right here and now, the fact of the matter is uh, there is so much good about relationships. So let's talk about why they're so valuable and what that actually quantifies at and looks like in terms of a priority for a relationship. Uh, Richard Rohr says, even the new physics tells us that merely manner, the mirror manifestation of spirit or consciousness relationship is the real thing. We used to think all the energy was in the particles of the atom. That's what we used to think. But now it seems the energy is in fact in the space between the particles. The space between you and me. The space between those of us that we're involved with, we're engaged with, we're, the, the, that's where the energy is. It is relational. And Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, who have almost more money than God, said the most important healthcare system in the world is a mother. How do you put things in her hands that she understands and can afford and use? Bill and Melinda Gates have spent millions, billions on vaccines, on nets, on all these things. What did they learn? Yes, those things are really important. Yes, money really matters. But it is in the context of relationship that makes those tools, those resources work. It is the relationship that is the magic uh, formula. So let's look at some examples. I'm going to look at individually, then let's look at organizationally. So what do we know about the value of relationship? Well, let's look at the opposite. We know divorce. That Men who go through divorce are six times as likely to experience depression. Women, only 3.5. Why? Men have smaller networks, and when they lose a key player, they don't have the same kind of backup. We know men with bad bosses are 20 to 40% more likely to have a heart attack than those who don't. What's the value of relationship? Where we don't, aren't causing heart attacks among each other. Living alone. Men who have heart attacks who return to live alone are four times as likely to die from a second heart attack. Four times. And what we know, we've all heard this, is that loneliness uh, has the same mortality rate as smoking. You've all heard that. In fact, they've got it down about 15 cigarettes a day. That's what the cost of loneliness is. It's twice that of obesity or type 2 diabetes. And loneliness is up 65% in the last decade. And if you question um, the, the stats on this, you can look at other measures in terms of suicide attempts and so forth. It's not just attitudinal uh, that we base that on. And you all saw these in numbers just a few weeks ago. Life expectancy has declined three years in a row in the U.S. for the first time since 1981 to 21. 1918 to 21. Life expectancy. Why? Because of loneliness. In a world where we have more people, we're more connected, we have more ways to communicate than ever before, we're more isolated. And then social connection. And, and you've seen these numbers. You have a 50% lower likelihood of early death, that is under 50. 50% lower if you have social connection in your life. And then happiness. It's interesting, this is recent data. Um, young adults, 18 to 34, have the record lowest level of happiness 
since they've been doing the surveys. And they've done a correlation. What is it that makes people more happy? The three leading things that make people more happy. Be married, doesn't work for all of us. Be married, be religious, doesn't work for all of us. But if you have a, and by the way, the research shows it is the church community that seems to be the driver of that, of being in community. And third, more sex. It is interesting when you look at we're in what is called a sex recession. Ages 18 to 29, the number of kids who have had no sex in the last year has doubled. Has doubled. Well, that wasn't what we were worried about when I was coming up. <laughs> you know, who would have guessed that we would have said, geez, those young fellas and those young gals, they're not having enough sex. <laughs> Wouldn't have been, been around things, but it turns out it is an indicator of what's going on. And in Japan, if you read about it, it's much worse than here. You also saw the numbers came out today, uh, our birth levels, three years in a row, down, down to the end of the last 11 years. Now let's look at organizations. What works in organizations? Well, those units that score above the median in customer employee engagement. Uh, score about 3.4 times better on a basket of financial services. A big old study been around a long time. Respect. The most impact uh, on, on engagement is respect. And yet over half of the people uh, it, it ups engagement. 55% and 54 of workers today say I am not respected by my leadership. Over half feel not respected. And then if you look at the strong customer relation, we saw a lot of this. Uh, strong customer relation, not satisfied with the product, strong customer relationship, 49% more likely to recommend, twice, or 49% more likely to be retained, twice as likely to recommend, and by 46% more. McKinsey says today that two-thirds of the economy's purchase decisions today uh, run on word of mouth. It used to be about 50%. Isn't it interesting, as the supply of relationships has declined, their value has actually gone up. Economists would, uh, would have fun with that. And then I want to look at the third area, and that's community. It's interesting about what's happened with community. There's been a huge run towards centralization in this world. And if you put the word big in front of business, government, labor, oil, pharma, you name it, it makes it less attractive. We have gotten very good at making things big and efficient. And for that, we've had great economic return. Yet what we hear about today is, are we going to break up Facebook? <coughs> Why? Because it's become almost, or maybe it has become monopolistic. We've begun to distrust the bigness and the monopoli monopolization. I want you to just think about these things in our life. Here's what's going on in our communities. Just a, an example of our gathering just getting hollowed out. Community banks are down 24% since 2010. And branch traffic is down 36%. The number of retail stores will close. 6,200 retail stores already announced in 2019. It was 5,000 in 2018. Bars. This is an interesting one. About 10,000 bars have closed over the last decade. In 1940, 90% of the alcohol consumed in this country was consumed in a bar or a pub. Today, it's 30%. That's another one. I didn't think my mom was a good Southern Baptist. I didn't think we'd be complaining about the bars closing. Her prayers are being answered. <laughs> another one, VFW Post. The number of VFW posts. We had about 11,000 in 1993 veterans of foreign war. Today, about 6,000. The number of American Legion numbers, about half what they were in the same year. When our soldiers came home from World War I, but particularly World War II, they had a third place. You've heard Starbucks, that third place. First place is home, second place is work. Where's the third place? Where do we gather? Where do we somehow interact? And what we find is that that third place for our soldiers who've been on two or three or four uh, different assignments, there's not a place they're going to. They're not going to the BFW Hall. And we see the PTSD and the isolation that's occurring here. And churches. We're losing about six to 10,000 churches per year. 
This isn't about religion. This is about local community resources that are drying up, six to 10,000 of them. And Pew has redefined what it means to be a regular church attender. It used to be three times a week. I'm, I'm sorry, a month. I grew up in a Baptist house, so that was a week. But anyway, <laughs> three times a week. Today, they say, or a month. Today, 1.3 times per month. We've even redefined what regular attendance is. Look at sports attendance, NFL, Major League Baseball, even college football, down significantly. Ticket sales are down some, attendance is down a lot. LSU probably gets a pass on that, but in the rest of the country, places where we used to go and gather and be together have declined dramatically. And yet, when we look at how important they are, what we find is, for example, local government is nearly twice as trusted as federal government. Local. When you look at stores and ranches, our experience was if you can get local teams involved in a local area, we can drive 10 to 20% more profits by just getting everybody engaged at a local community level. Workers, I've already said, 57% if they're engaged, you have 57% more effort and 87% less likely to believe. The top teams, when venture folks and private equity folks look at organizations, what they found is that that top team seems to work together. Well, this is according to information from McKinsey, there's almost a two times likelihood of good performance. And in communities that are close-knit, we find there is less suicide, there's less overdoses, there's less idle workers, that is, people have stopped looking, there's less crime, community renewal has some great numbers uh, on that, and when they're connected, there's more upward mobility. So the community turns out to be really, really crucial. Um, and I love what Henry Nowen says. He says, the community is where the person you least want to live with, be with, always lives. Community is tough. And uh, there's a line from the movie Instant Family. Things that matter are hard. Community is hard. Relationships are hard. We too often now have the luxury of discarding relationships because they're hard. They're really meaningful. So we look at all that, just a couple things I would stress here, is there is a coming change. Uh, I believe, I spoke at a conference in Cambridge uh, been a couple of years ago, and in the UK and a number of other countries, they're saying that public companies now are gonna be responsible not just looking at financial capital, but social capital, environmental capital. They're gonna be held accountable for a broader range of things that stakeholders require, not just shareholders, uh, but, but stakeholders. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to that. I wanted to say something about community renewal that's important to me. I've, I've been here, I've been in Shawnee, I've been in Palestine, uh, I've been in Allendale, I've been in a number of communities and so forth. And what community renewal is doing really fits for the experiences we have in terms of local market stuff. First of all, having a scalable model that you can do then locally and, and get committed uh, action. It brings intention, organization, resources, and process to local challenges. It's about the local piece. And it's interesting, care is not something you can buy, it's something people have to offer. You can buy service, you get somebody to serve you a cup of coffee, getting them to care is a little different proposition. Secondly, it's about being locally empowered versus top down. So much of what we've tried to do around community historically has been a top down, let me come in and tell you what to do. Our experience was it didn't work, but the way Michael Porter at Harvard describes that, he says an A level of commitment to a B quality plan beats a B level of commitment to an A level plan. We found that over and over again in 20,000 local market efforts with teams is engage people, get them involved, and what they come up with, if it's not right, it can be fixed. If they're not engaged, you can't, you can't fix it. And what we also found that I think fits here is if you're doing the same thing, which is often the bureaucratic top-down approach, if you're doing the same thing in every market, you're doing the wrong thing in about half the markets because markets are different. It's dramatic. And we would find markets very different that were two miles away. Oh, on the other side of the railroad track uh, and, and uh, the, the area where the gates are, it was very different. So this ability to do it at a micro level really matters. Um, 
And it is about having something local, in our experience, tied into something central. We used to say, in the work that we did, is that each local team could not invent the process. But if we asked them the right questions, they could provide the answer and be committed to what needed to be done. And that's the key, I believe, in terms of what's local. Uh, and so the results are, some cases more GD, in some cases more jobs, in some cases just more people knowing each other, in some cases it's more people helping in and working with someone else. That's very consistent with our experience across 20,000 markets. So, what do we do about it? In one word, in one word, I would say the answer is intention. Relational leadership is about being intentional. Let's talk about finally three things. First of all, Casey Stingle, very wise, said the key to managing is keep the five guys who hate you away from the four guys who haven't quite made up their minds. <laughs> leadership is really tough. We all know that. Those of us in leadership experience how hard that is. Leadership presupposes moving from one place, I'm here, and leadership says I want to get to another place. It's about uh, moving there. It's about aspiration to be a different place. And that if you come back to our central premise, if relationships are a single most valuable and value-creating resource, then what do we do about that? And, and I would call that relational, relational leadership. And that is a couple things. Number one, you can buy talent, but you have to develop relationships. You can acquire someone to work for you. You can hire them. But all the rest of it is developing productive relationships, getting their energy, their input, getting them committed, making work, dealing with the hard stuff, dealing with the disagreement. Um, and so when I talk about strategic, intentional, by design leadership that's designed to attract, grow, and retain productive relationships, the function of leadership is to produce more leaders. The function of leadership is to produce more leadership. That's how we scale. We scale when other people are able to take on more, which allows us to take on more. And so Jim Collins said the key is to get the right people in the bus. I would refine that slightly by saying the key is to get the right stakeholder relationships on the bus and keep them on the bus. It is about relationships, not just with the shareholder, but it's also the customers and the employees and the bank and the community. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on right now at the University of Texas at Dallas, I'm working on a project I've been helping them with some, is how do you put community at the table? How do you make community a member, a stakeholder at the table for business and for other entities? It's more than being nice. All for being nice, but relational leadership is about constructive dissatisfaction. I love this quote. Um, this CEO says, look, I've got three groups of stakeholders, my shareholders, my customers, and my employees. If I were to fully satisfy any one of the three, we would be bankrupt. My job is to keep them all constructively dissatisfied and name to make the enterprise successful so that we can deliver for all of them. Constructive dissatisfaction. In the nitty gritty, down in the trenches, where life is real and where people disagree and where we're not all aligned, that's the job of leadership. We never get it perfect, but that's the job. So I want to talk finally in closing the three P's of relational leadership that I think are so important. The best time to build a local fire station is before your house catches on fire. I think we as a country, you say it as a country, as a state, as a local, I think we're at risk right now of our house catching on fire. And I think it's going to take a more intentional approach to leadership than we've ever had before, relational leadership, if we're going to deal with that. P number one, we have to treat relationships as our most valuable strategic resource and priority. Um, Stakeholder relationships, if you want to grow, if you want to expand, scalability is tied to can you create more leaders. I don't mean carrying titles, I'm saying everybody doing their part. Committed, being all in, being a leader. Um, Thomas Friedman had this comment on the Iraq War. But the big change came when the officers running the wars understood that relationships built 
axiomatic order in pay IA for killing that thing. One relationship built, an imam or an insurgent was worth so much more than one more person killed. Even in war, sooner or later, if you win the war, sooner or later you have to win the peace, and that's about constructive relationships. All of us, whether going through the war, whether sooner or later, we've got to win the peace. Uh, so what is the relationship leadership really required? Well, I think it required doing the work. Three things. Really saying, who are my key stakeholders? Naming them, you know, whether it's customers or workers or partners, or it's at the local community level. Where is your relational risk and opportunity? Many people here with a financial background know all about managing risk. Relational risk is the same thing. Which groups of key stakeholders am I at risk of losing? Which ones have much more potential if I could just expand it? Which type should we be attracting? And which group of stakeholders right now are we over-investing in? They're taking so much time that they're stealing from the other. You have to think intentional about that in terms of who your key stakeholders are. And then finally, what's your stakeholder scorecard? We can all say what our financial scorecard is, you know, what our budget, what our plan is, and so forth. What is your relational scorecard? How shall you track and keep score of those key relationships? So make it a strategic priority. The question is, for whatever it is you're wanting to get done, are your relationships big enough to get that job done? Are your relationships big enough to get done whatever your hope, your dream, the thing you most want to get done, are your relationships up to it? Or will you have to grow and build stronger relationships in order to get there? Second P, purpose. Is it commitment worthy? We're living in a world today, particularly as millennials, millennials and IG come along, purpose really matters, unlike anything we've seen before. So when we look at that, uh, Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any hand. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any hand. Purpose is the currency by which organizational relationships turn and grow and, and build. So purpose and vision, where we're trying to go, what we're hoping to accomplish, it's bigger than strategy, it's more sustained than, than profits. I often talk about purpose as both the petty, the petty glue, you know, keeps us together, and the petty lubricant that keeps us moving while we're together. And, and so what does that mean? It means relational leadership is on purpose, and it gains trust by a purpose that is worth others committing to. Purpose bigger than me as a CEO, bigger than me as the head of the department, bigger than me as a person in the community. Uh, really, really critical. Purpose is a magnet for attracting talent, particularly today. If you don't have sufficient purpose, you will not have, I believe, over time, sufficient uh, talent. Um, and it purposely serving the different stakeholders of the different communities uh, that you work with. They don't all have the same purpose. So, uh, Scott Cook at Intuit has a great question that he says they used at Intuit. And anytime they look at a product, the question is, what can we where can we change lives most profoundly? It's a great question. Whatever it is you're involved in, whatever you're doing, and not all of us are in the business of curing cancer and solving world hunger, some of us do some fairly mundane things. We can change the world and make a difference in whatever it is we do if we pursue it purposely. So here's the question. Is your purpose big enough to get and keep the right relationships uh, on the bus? And finally, last, is about sharing power. Many of us got where we are by controlling and affording power. Many of us have been successful because we were exercising great control. And that's all the great thing. But we find that power has this very insidious thing. This is research on the University of California, Berkeley, again, where they can do brain scans. And they get these examples where people were actually put into powerful positions with the brain scans on them. And here's what they said. Power has similar effects on the frontal lobes as brain trauma. Blunt trauma and power have the same impact. Through brain trauma, you become a sociopath. When you feel powerful, you stop attending carefully to what other people think and feel. All of us have seen that in a boss. Many of us have experienced that as a boss. You look back and you say, you know, 
I got a little intoxicated. I got a little overdone with not sharing the power. Hoarding power does not scale. So, uh, you know, Peter Drucker talked about the we talk about the power of a relational culture, being a leader where relationships really matter. He says culture beats strategy for breakfast. And I would add to that, culture also beats laws and policies and a bunch of other stuff we put in place. If we don't get the culture right, it turns out it, is, it will undo us. So what does it mean? It means relational leadership is about a high performance, high commitment culture as opposed to control compliance. The march of centralized you know, power means that top down these days uh, has to be offset, I think, by more local uh, kinds of empowerment. Um, and, and what we find is that engaged, diverse teams that are really engaged learn how to, we're in the NBA playoffs now, engaged playoff teams learn how to share the ball, which is about sharing uh, power. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Sally Krajcik, former CEO of Smith Barney, used an example, she says, if I were to name, she's a big UNC basketball player, and she says, if I were to name these five people, folks, everybody would say they're among the top ten to ever play basketball at UNC. And then she goes through each five, each of those five are point guards. And if you tried to go to the NCAA tournament with five point guards, it wouldn't work. So that means sharing the ball, but it also means not everybody plays point guard. We play different roles. And it is that difference, that diversity makes uh, such a difference. Uh, Research out of MIT says team performance is 35 percent a function of the amount of face-to-face -face contact. It's a big study. So to say all of that, let me net all of that out. I'm more than out of time. Uh, let me net all that out in terms of the way that we need what we need from relationships. I can summarize it all based on a T-shirt I saw at the Pop Belly Sandwich Shop on Beltline Road in Dallas. Uh, and here's what it says: Get in here before we both start. <laughs> when it comes to relationships, whether whatever our role, whether we consider ourselves to be the boss or not, the helper or the healthy, it turns out we mutually, dramatically need relationship. Thank you. I'm out of time. Do we have time for just a couple of questions or whatever? Take any surely I've offended somebody in all this. Maybe several. Uh, any questions or comments or rebuttals on anything I've gone over?
truly makes leadership the expectations. Everybody expects entitled some to them that my group, my tribe, should get better treatment. That is a problem in purpose. When the purpose is big enough, we put aside that kind of petty stuff. So when I look at an organization, and I look back at my own experience, when things became petty, as a leader, what I look for is not how I can fix the pettiness, although I like it. How do we elevate purpose so people will be able to come alongside and work with that other person in my community that I least like? So to me, that's a purpose deficit that we, as leaders now, it used to be my way the highway, I give the rules, go do it. Today, I've got to be a merchandising promoter of purpose that's big enough that people will come alongside in spite of their disagreement. It's a great question. Other questions or comments or rebuttals? Anything else? Surely I've offended someone. Well, yes. I'm just curious at uh, what point do you think uh, this becomes, you know, relationships become a, uh, an issue versus profit and sustainability and all those things when you get to the point where you say, okay, okay, I'm not. I've made it, success is here, now I've got to change my, my identity. You know, and, and looking back at your life and just maybe give me a... You know, uh, Steve talked about the first mountain and the second mountain. I was with David Brooks uh, last week when he was in Dallas, and, and, and he presented to a large group on that. And I, I think the issue of us getting earlier in our careers to purpose is really significant. Here's where the great hope is. Our millennials already have that hope. Our millennials are hoping that we as leaders, many of us who tend to be older because it's taken a while to get here, that we have figured out purpose that's bigger than self. I'm not saying they have all the answers, they've got their own issues. But if we're gonna lead going forward, we're gonna have to have a level of purpose that's beyond profit. Now, if you don't have profit, you don't have an angel, some of the worst nights I've ever spent is dealing with people who make payroll on Friday. So I've lived through that and it's as real as a heart attack. But at the end of the day, that is a means to something bigger. And when we're doing something, I don't care if it's a janitor. I, I worked three years as a janitor in college. I was you know, on a, an athletic scholarship, got injured, and that's what I did to keep my, my scholarship. And there is a way to be purposeful in janitorial work, just like there is trying to cure cancer. And our job as leaders is to find that purpose because anything we do has value and to merchandise that and make that the center of things and so that profit becomes a means that helps us continue to carry out our purpose. And we've got a ways to go from that. We're either going to get better at that or I believe capitalism in this country will continue to come under fire. So, so it's up to us. And just one final thing, I don't think the answer is going to be top down from Washington. It's going to be at the local level when enough of us get in enough pain and do enough of the things where we work, where we go to church, in our community, to make a difference. It will be bottom-up change. And it's, it's really important. It's a great question, but I think that's what it's going to take. I am more than out of time. Thank you so much. I've got books over here.